Hello and welcome to our second Prelude webinar for Summerfest 2020. My name is Allison Bowles and I am the Education and Community Programming Manager for La Jolla Music Society. We're so happy that you're here tonight and I should note that as we begin, your audio has been muted and your video has been turned off. This will help make sure our lecture goes smoothly and avoid having people talk over one another. It also preserves your anonymity so that we can record this session. Most importantly, it will allow us to hear our host, Eric Bromberger, clearly. Our plan is to run tonight's webinar in two parts. First, with Eric's lecture, which will include some visual and audio examples. And second, with a question answer session led by our artistic director, Leah Rosenthal. For those of you who are joining us live, you can participate in two different ways. You can find the chat button at the bottom of your screen or the top center, depending on which view of Zoom you're using. If that button isn't visible, you may need to find the button that says more and has three dots. From there, you can select chat from the menu. Leah will keep track of our questions and you can send those directly to her using the all panelists button, or you can send public comment to all panelists and attendees. And you'll be able to find that by using the drop down menu in the chat. Let's take a moment to test out this chat function, make sure that everyone feels comfortable. Please take a moment to say hello and share your favorite memory from the first three concerts of this year's Summerfest. And while you do that, I'd like to share a little bit about La Jolla Music Society's new Artist Cares Fund. We launched this fund in response to the pandemic to support over 80 Summerfest artists who were not able to perform at this year's festival. I hope you'll consider supporting our artists today by making a donation. And you can find that information on our website. Looks like our chat is going along there. So I will move on and introduce our host, Eric Bromberger. Eric has been the program annotator for La Jolla Music Society since 1983. He is so talented and sought after and adored by all the staff and guests who are here tonight. So thank you so much. Please take it away, Eric. Welcome to the second week of Summerfest 2020. We'll hear eight different pieces this week, and here's a curious thing. Every one of these pieces was written by a very young composer. Every piece but one was written by someone 34 years or younger, and the one exception, Prokofiev, was only 39. We'll hear a piece by a 17-year-old composer, and his name isn't even Mozart. I don't know if Enon set out to create three concerts of music by very young composers, but that's what we have this weekend. This will not be a week of mellow retrospection by aging masters. Instead, these pieces are full of fire, freshness, energy, enthusiasm, risk-taking, and adventures. I'm not going to try to talk about all eight pieces in this lecture. Instead, I'll choose one piece from each program and talk about it in more detail. I'll start the concert, uh, I'll start with the concert on Wednesday, and I want to begin by taking us back to the summer of 1876. That was a very busy year. Wagner was in Bayreuth preparing for the first complete performance of The Ring, which took place that August. Brahms spent that summer in the resort town of Baden-Baden in Western Germany, putting the final touches on his first symphony, which would be premiered that November. Across the Atlantic, things were very busy too. In March of 1876, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. 
On July 4th, Americans celebrated their centennial anniversary. That fall, Samuel Tilden was elected president of the United States. You may never have heard of President Tilden. He won the popular vote that year, but for the second time in American history, the loser of the popular vote won the Electoral College and Rutherford B. Hayes became president. And at the start of the summer of 1876, way out in Montana, a hot-headed young general named Custer rushed his exhausted troops toward the Little Bighorn. At the end of June, just as Custer and the 7th Cavalry were being annihilated, a young Frenchman took the train from Paris to Normandy, where he spent the summer composing. His name was Gabriel Faure, and he was only 31 years old. Faure was quite handsome. He was irresistible to women. But at age 31, he was still struggling as a composer. That summer in Normandy, he completed what would be his first masterpiece, his Violin Sonata No. 1, and that's the piece that will open the concert on Wednesday night. This is one of the great violin sonatas. Heifetz made a famous recording of it, and it's played regularly today by violinists such as Perlman, Zuckerman, Midori, Josh Bell, Hilary Hahn. But here's a surprise. Foray's first violin sonata has never been performed at Summerfest. This is the first Summerfest, and finally this sonata will be performed on a Summerfest program. I described these concerts as being the work of very young composers, and Foray's first sonata shows a lot of youthful virtues. It's full of energy, and there is a wonderful freshness about this music. If you don't know this sonata, you're in for a terrific discovery. Foray marks the first movement, Allegro Molto, very fast. It really goes, but it is not full of violence or conflict. Instead, it moves along with a very elegant energy, and the music seems awash in constant eighth notes as it rushes ahead. was not a violinist. He was an organist and a pianist, but he writes beautifully for the violin. This is a very difficult sonata for violinists, but it sits very nicely under the hand and it's a lot of fun to play. It is also passionate, powerful music, and it can soar to the very top of the violin's range and turn dramatic. through all four movements, but I want to show you a couple of specific places. One of the most impressive movements in the sonata is the third, which is a scherzo. Foray marks it allegro vivo, fast and lively, and he really means it. But there are some surprises in this scherzo. Most scherzos are in 3-4, but this one has a metric marking I've never seen before. It's in two eight and then with a one in parenthesis. Two eight is a really short measure and it me and the one means that the performers have to count each measure in one. This music goes like a rocket and you need a first class violinist to bring it off. It's fast, 
It's all spiccato, which means that it's bounced off the string. And Foray marks it, as you can see, leggerissimo, as light as possible. Here's the beginning of that movement. <laughs> This movement is only four minutes long and it goes at light speed all the way through. You should come out of it almost breathless. The last movement has a lovely beginning. Foray marks it dolcissimo, as sweet as possible, and it makes a perfect conclusion to this elegant sonata. <coughs> first violin sonata is graceful, melodic music, beautifully written for the violin. Sit back and enjoy this wonderful music composed by a very young man during the very busy summer of 1876. From the concert on Friday night, I'll talk about the sonata for unaccompanied cello by Zoltan Kodai. Kodai wrote this sonata during another tumultuous time. World War I was raging across Europe when Kodai composed this music during the summer of 1915. He too was a very young composer. When he wrote this sonata, Kodai was a 33-year-old professor at the Academy of Music in Budapest. <coughs> Music for a solo cello is rare. It's very difficult to write for a solo stringed instrument because there is no way to supply the harmonic accompaniment that a piano would bring. It's difficult enough to write such music for violin, but for an instrument with a very deep range like the cello, it's even more difficult, and music for solo cello is rare. In fact, Kodai's sonata for unaccompanied cello was the first substantial work for solo cello since the suites that Bach had written two centuries earlier. Like the Bach suites, this sonata demands an unbelievably good cellist. And on uh, this, at Summerfest, we'll hear it performed by one of the best cellists on the planet, composing, uh, performing some of the most difficult music ever written for the instrument. I doubt that you'll ever hear a better performance of this piece than the one Alicia Weilerstein will give on Friday night. Kodai wrote this sonata for a great cellist, Yeno de Kerpli, who was the cellist of the Waldbauer Kerpli Quartet. That quartet was one of the great string quartets in Europe before World War II. They gave the first Hungarian performances of Debussy's string quartet with Debussy in attendance, and they gave the premiere of the first four of Bartok's quartets. Here's a photo of the quartet uh, with Bartok seated on the far left and Kodai seated on the right with carefully standing over him. This photo was taken about 1909. The quartet survived for another 40 years and then it broke up when the communists took over Hungary in 1946. This photo taken over a hundred years ago looks like a memory from a long forgotten era and it is, but I'm now going to tell you a very strange thing. When I was a little boy, I knew cellist Yeno de Kerpoli very well. He and his wife got out of Hungary after the war. They came to the United States, and he got a job teaching cello at the University of Redlands. 
My father also taught at Redlands and we became very good friends with the de Kerpleys. This was in the early 1950s. I was about seven or eight and I remember him very well. He was a huge man with a very deep voice and a very strong accent. He was very gentle, but he was also very serious. I heard him play many times and the only time he ever smiled was when he made a mistake. He smoked all the time and he used an ivory cigarette holder clamped in his teeth with a cigarette stuck in the end of that. I'd never seen anything like that and when I asked my mother what it was, she explained it to me by saying, he's European. You'll have some idea of how good a cellist Carefully was when you hear the music Kodai wrote specifically for him. Here's the very beginning and the first few seconds of the sonata will tell you how powerful, passionate, and soaring this music is. <laughs> may sound like it's based on folk music, but it's not. This was the period when Bartok and Kodai were making vast collections of the folk music of Eastern Europe, but Kodai was adamant that this sonata did not contain folk music. It was his own composition, though it often sounds like folk music. <clears throat> the sonata is a huge piece. It's in three movements that stretch out to over half an hour. Box cello suites last only about 18 to 20 minutes each, but Kodai's sonata is huge and it makes really fiendish demands on his performer who is on stage alone for 30 minutes and it asks for unusual concentration from the audience. Again, I won't take you through this music from start to finish, but I do want to point out a few things. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of them is the range of this music from the very bottom of the cello's lowest strings, it can reach up five octaves higher, so that some of the writing for cello here would be very high even on the violin. Listen to this. It's a cello playing this music, not a violin. <laughs> that are lower than even a cellist can usually play. Kodai has the cellist tune the two lower strings down a half step. <clears throat> so the cello in this piece has a B string and an F sharp string, and these let Kodai produce all kinds of chords not possible in standard tuning. When Alicia Weilerstein comes out to play this piece, she will already have tuned those strings down a half step. It's not just the range that makes this piece so difficult. In some passages, Kodai has the cellist play with the bow and simultaneously pluck the strings with the free fingers of his left hand. <clears throat> the cellist has to maintain a singing line with the bow in his right hand and at the same time pluck notes with the left and make the whole thing sound easy. Here's Janos Starker playing such a passage. Thank mm -hmm.
pitches here that are amazing just for the kinds of sounds Kodai gets from the cello. He requires every technique known to string players. Harmonic, ponticello bowing right on top of the bridge, soltasto bowing out over the fingerboard, all at once and much of it at very high speed. I don't know if there has ever been a more brilliant piece written for solo cello than Kodai's unaccompanied sonata. It's a big, passionate, exciting piece, and it's one of the cornerstones of the cello repertory. As I said, you'll probably never hear it played better than you will when Alicia Weilerstein plays it on Friday night. Last week, I pointed out that Schub a Summerfest 2020 began with a Schubert quintet, and it will conclude with another. It began with a great string quintet in C major, and it concludes Saturday night with the famous Trout Quintet. The Trout Quintet came about in a very unusual way, and I want to talk about that for a moment. In 1817, Schubert wrote a song called Die Forelle, the Trout. It's very short. It's only two minutes long, and it is beautifully made. It begins as the composer looks down into a stream and sees a beautiful trout holding its place in the sun-flecked water. Schubert's music is relaxed and happy as we see the beautiful trout. <laughs> But then the song gets tricky. The fisherman, who is on the opposite bank, laments that he cannot catch the trout, so he roils up the water, confuses the fish, which bites the lure, and covered in blood, the fish is pulled out of the water and killed. It's a very clever and expressive song, especially for a 20-year-old composer, and it quickly became quite popular. One scholar has said that it went straight to the top of the charts in 1817, Vienna. Now I want to jump two years later to the summer of 1819 when Schubert was invited to go on a walking tour of Upper Austria by the singer Michael Vogel. Schubert had never been out of Vienna much and now at age 22 he spent the summer walking through some of the most glorious scenery on the planet. Schubert loved it. He loved being out of Vienna, loved seeing the countryside, loved walking. To his friends at home, Schubert descri described the countryside as unbelievably beautiful. Schubert and Vogel spent most of the summer in Vogel's hometown of Steyr. That town had a very active musical community and they were aware that they had a distinguished guest in Schubert. The cellist of that group, a man named Sylvester Palmgartner, asked Schubert to write a piece of chamber music for them, but he had two conditions. First, that Schubert had to compose only for the musicians on hand, and second, that he build the piece on the theme from Die Forella, a song that Palmgartner particularly liked. Schubert set to work on what would become the Trout Quintet, and 200 years later, it remains one of his most popular works. Schubert wrote this music in a beautiful setting, and it's hard not to feel that this music in some ways reflects the place where it was written. From the very beginning, it breathes an air of relaxation. I should say something about the unusual instrumentation of the Trout Quintet. 
we think automatically that a piano quintet is for string quartet plus piano, and there are great examples of that kind of quintet. Schumann, Brahms, Shostakovich, Elgar, and many others have written quintets for piano and string quartet. But neither Schubert quintet at this year's Summerfest conforms to that model. On opening night, we heard a Schubert quintet for string quartet plus cello, and the trout quintet is for an even more unexpected combination of instruments. Schubert drops the second violin and adds a double bass, so that this music is performed by violin, viola, cello, double bass, and piano. He did that not by choice, but because that's what Palmgartner asked him to do. Those were the five instruments on hand that summer in Steyr. But Schubert was Schubert, and he does some magical things with that combination of instruments. <coughs> Excuse me. He's got two bass instruments, the cello and the really deep double bass, so he doesn't need any more bass, which is usually the part taken by the pianist's left hand. That frees the piano up considerably. It doesn't have to be playing accompaniment all the time because now both hands are free to take a melodic role. Schubert takes full advantage of that opportunity. In this piece, listen particularly to the writing for piano. Much of it is set very high in the piano's register and often both hands are in treble clef. most interesting things about the trout quintet is its range, <clears throat> range of sounds. That sound stretches from the deep sonority of the cello in bass to the silvery high sound of violin and piano. And it's fun to listen to this piece to hear how Schubert turns Palmgartner's requirements to his own uses. I want to go to the fourth movement, which is the set of variations on Schubert's song Die Forelle. Schubert would not have felt that the request to base this song, uh, base this quintet on a song was an imposition. He often used themes from his songs as the basis for variation movements in his chamber music, and the best example is Death and the Maiden Quartet. Note one thing, Schubert only uses the theme from the happy part of Die Forelle when he sees the trout in the sunny water. He doesn't use the theme from the end when the trout is caught and killed. The theme is very relaxed and I'll remind you how it goes. Schubert then begins by giving that song theme just to the strings. The piano sits this one out. gives the first variation to the piano, and remember what I said about the pianos being free to play very high in its register. Schubert sets both the pianist hands in treble clef here, and the piano has a high, silvery, sparkling sound. I won't take you through all five variations, but I will say that they are all melodic variations. Sometimes composers will seize on a rhythm or the bass line of a theme and write variations on those. But here, Schubert focuses on the melody in each of the variations. 
Remember too what I said about his imaginative writing for all five instruments. In the fifth variation, it's the cello that takes center stage. the whole piece off with a jaunty finale that makes a very nice ending. I want to show you one thing in that finale. We call this piece the Trout Quintet because of the variations in the fourth movement, but in fact Schubert slips little quotations from the song into every movement in this quintet. If Paumgartner asks Schubert to incorporate his famous song, Schubert gives him that song every time he turns around, even if Paumgartner probably didn't recognize it at first. Here's the second theme of the finale. Do you hear Di Farella here? <laughs> It's easy to take the Trout Quintet for granted. It's relaxed, it's melodic, it's charming, and if we want, we can just sit back and enjoy it for all its good tunes. But at the same time, this is a very subtle, a very sophisticated piece of music. Schubert was handed a totally unexpected assignment when he was asked for a piece in the middle of his vacation, but the 22-year-old composer turned that request into his first really mature piece of chamber music and one of the best-loved pieces of all time. And that may be a good note to end on. As I, at the start, I noted that the surprising thing about the music in the final week of Summerfest 2020 is that it was all written by young composers, really young composers. A number of the composers this week were in their early 30s, and some, like Schubert, were in their early 20s, and one of them was a teenager. Joseph Sook was only 17 when he wrote the piano quartet that we'll hear on Friday night. As I said, this week will not bring us the mellow introspection of aging masters. We won't hear Beethoven's late quartets or Bach, Bach's Art of the Fugue or Brahms' four serious songs. Instead, we'll hear music full of fire, passion, intensity, and energy. As I worked on this talk, I was amazed by how impressive this music is, not just by how beautiful and expressive it is, but by how accomplished and sophisticated all these composers were, even at so young an age. Thank you, Eric. What a great talk. I am so excited for these concerts. I've had a great time tuning in to our first three, and I know that our conclusion is going to be just as great. Um, Leah, would you like to join us on the screen here? Sure. Hello. Beautiful job, Eric. Thank you. So we have a quiet bunch tonight. I have not received any questions as of yet. So if anyone has a question they'd like to ask Eric, this is our final prelude webinar this summer. And we are couldn't be more delighted that Eric shifted his platform and was willing to go on this ride with us to do this over Zoom. And I actually think it's quite an effective way to do it. And I'm actually, I'm enjoying um, listening to these preludes with the musical example and the slides much more than I thought I would virtually rather than being in the hall. Um, so thank you for that. And just vamping a little bit, if anyone wants to ask any 
final questions. Um, I mentioned in the chat that I was able to listen to a bit of the rehearsal this afternoon and the musicians just sounded glorious already. And what a beautiful hall to, to listen to this music and obviously as well this unique um, instrumentation with the double bass um, and no second violinist and yet it somehow just creates this incredible uh, quality of sound and color in the sound. So yeah, actually we you know have what? a question that came through Leah maybe oh, good. The one that you oh, could... in the Q&A. Yeah great. So great. Gail and David ask how does the empty hall affect the acoustics and do the musicians have to compensate for that? That's a great question and actually the hall was built and the fabrics and the wood that was chosen in the hall was built so if there were actually people in the hall, it doesn't change the sound. Um, so it's very, it's a very slight difference when we have a full house or a half hall versus no one in the hall. So it, actually that, that sort of um, thinking and study about how to create the sound was the Toyota, uh, Yasuhisa Toyota, the acoustician, took that into consideration with the types of wood, again, the types of fabric. And so um, really the, the sound is just slightly different, I would say, when there's a full hall. Um, a little bit more vibrant when no one is in there just because it's completely echoing and um, it was my own personal concert today so I enjoyed it very much. Lucky, lucky. <laughs> oh, let's see one more. Do we know how many, um, how many, what does it mean, variations there were of the trout? Revisions. Do we know how many revisions, Eric, there were of the trout? Oh, that's a good question. Um, everyone says that he wrote it during the summer in Steyr. He actually started it and he got it drafted. Then he took it back uh, to Vienna and finished it over the winter. So when I talk about it being a very sophisticated uh, piece of music, there's a reason for that. He worked very hard on it uh, and finished it that winter. I assume that it, it, it the first performance was given in Steyr, and Paumgartner, who was not a particularly good cellist, had a lot of trouble with his part. Uh, but the, uh, the piece was more or less done by the winter of uh, 1819. Wonderful. I saw another question come in here asking about our prelude that we did last week. And someone was hoping to review that lecture so that they could better appreciate the music they heard in the first three concerts. And you absolutely can do that. You log in to, well, you don't even log in. You visit our digital concert hall, which is ljms.org slash digital dash concert dash hall. Maybe we can get someone that, to add that into the chat here. And we have our prelude from last week. We have our open rehearsals. We have an encounter that we did yesterday for students who are looking to become professionals, either as classical musicians or in the artistic administration side of things. Um, so, yeah. yeah. There's another question came in for you, Eric. The Schumann Quartet for tomorrow. Do you have any, do you have a brief comments or anything about that work? Um, yeah. Uh, it's one of his least known chamber works, and Schumann was afraid of writing chamber music, so that it wasn't until the spring or the summer of 1842, while Clara was gone, that he finally sat down and confronted uh, chamber music. He wrote with great difficulty the three string quartets, then he wrote the string uh, the piano quintet, which everyone loves and which is regarded as one of the great pieces of chamber music. And then he pressed on at the very end of the summer and into the fall, I think, and wrote the piano quartet. And that is not such an easy, um, uh, that has not become as well known as the quintet or actually any of the quartets. It's an unusual medium, uh, a string or piano quartet is, uh, presents all kinds of problems of balance. Um, I think the part of that uh, quartet that I think the most effective is the slow movement, which really, really works well. Uh, there's a lot of double stopping in the strings. You feel Schumann straining to make the piece sound bigger than just three string players will let it sound. But I go to that piece to hear the slow movement. 
it's absolutely stunning, the slow movement. Let's see, Allison. I think in the Q and A, there's one more question. Um, do you? So someone asked, "Do you think I, this is for the trout? He could have parts played so he could hear it, or did he get feedback from the instrumentalists about difficulty in playing the sections?" Uh, that, that, it's an interesting question. I don't think he got any feedback at all. I think that he went to work and wrote the piece that he wanted. And as I said, uh, Palmgartner got a part too hard for him to play. Palmgartner was a fairly wealthy um, um, industrialist and who played the cello just for fun. And he ended up with the part too hard uh, for him. So I think when Schubert started writing, he wrote you know, he said, I've got to write for these five instruments, but he did not make any concessions to anyone. Great, thank you. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably all the time that we have today. Eric, thank you so much for this wonderful preview. Leah and Anthony, who's working behind the scenes, thank you for being here and for supporting us in this. And to all of you who are tuning in, thank you. We appreciate you being here and we hope you'll show your support by donating to the LJMS Artist Cares Fund. We'll be on Zoom again tomorrow for an encounter with four of our festival artists exploring the impact that the pandemic has had on their lives and on the arts in general, followed by an open rehearsal on Thursday and of course our last three concerts on Wednesday, Friday and Saturday evening. We'll see you then. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.